What if you could catch obesity as easily as you catch a cold? <laughs> now, some scientists believe they found a highly contagious virus that makes us fat. The idea that someone behind me sneezes and I can catch this virus and I can catch obesity is quite shocking. If you've got a runny nose, the most common thing is you wipe your nose and say, oh, it's very nice to meet you, and then they wipe their nose. And so it's a good idea to do what your mother told you to do and wash your hands. There could be many viruses out there which cause obesity and we are not aware of them. From the very first moment I heard it, it seemed to me that it was a logical thing because viruses cause so many other problems. Frozen to minus 80 degrees, files of the virus, known as AD36, are kept in the laboratories of Wayne State University in Michigan. In charge of the small research team investigating this pathogen is the Indian scientist, Dr. Nikhil Duranda. Finding out what the virus is, why it makes us fat, and how far it has spread, has become his life's mission. The concept of virus causing obesity is so far away from the mainstream causes of obesity that it is going to need much more convincing or much more evidence, simply because it's a very different idea. And we'll do it. Current explanations see the obese either as prisoners of their genetic code or gluttons who just eat too much. But Duranda's virus theory could prove the biggest leap forward in our understanding of obesity since scientists started looking at why we get fat. As more of us indulge in high-fat foods and a sedentary lifestyle, the obesity epidemic is taking hold throughout the world. And in the US, even with 54 million Americans claiming to be on a diet, it has now become the number one health crisis. There's been a shocking rise in the prevalence of obesity in the last 10 or 20 years. 61% of us are overweight or obese, and this is continuing to increase. So what we're seeing is no end in sight. The question is, are we eating, simply eating too much, or being too sedentary? Will that explain it? Apparently not. We s didn't suddenly stop exercising and start eating huge portions in about 1980. And suddenly, this epidemic of obesity zoomed upward. So if current theories don't explain the figures, could a virus be the cause? Maps compiled by the Center for Disease Control offer a frightening possibility. Changing from blue to red, they show how, after the 1980s, the numbers of the obese doubled in the United States. When I look at it, I see a certain pattern. It looks like, like a fire, a wildfire, that started somewhere on the east coast or eastern side of the United States. And it goes from east to west. Is the virus spreading obesity like a disease across the United States? The story of how this virus might be causing a fat plague starts on the other side of the world, in India. <laughs> Bombay. It was here during the hot monsoon of 1988 that Duranda first came across the virus that would change the course of his life. At that time, he had a flourishing practice as a doctor specializing in obesity. Today, he has returned to the city to visit friends and family. I do notice a lot of changes taking place in Bombay in the last five years. I do see 
McDonald's and lots of fast food joints uh, coming up in Bombay. My father started obesity practice in early 60s. So I grew up seeing the problems of obese people, how they are taken for a ride by quacks, the sufferings they have to undergo and whatnot. Right, you were 78 kilos. So all I wanted to do was practice obesity like my father. Vinod, Duranda's father, pioneered the study of obesity in India. To date, he has treated more than 65,000 cases, including himself and his family. Obesity runs in our family. My parents were obese, my sisters were obese, I was obese, my son Nikhil was obese, triceps, and I could say that it was a blessing in disguise, so far as I am concerned, especially because in this practice there is nothing like visits, night visits, and all that. No emergencies whatsoever. So this I really was to my liking. Duranda's discovery started with another virus found in chickens. During the 1980s, Poultry sellers were losing money as their birds caught a mysterious disease. In the countryside, livelihoods were threatened as the epidemic took hold. Hundreds of thousands of birds were dying. The only hope was to discover the virus that was killing them. At the Bombay Veterinary College, the culprit was eventually identified, thanks to the pioneering work of the late Dr. Sharad Ajinka. And named after his initials, SMAM1. Dr. Sharad Ajinka was a family friend of ours, and one day at his home, we were talking about his work that he had done in identifying this virus in chickens. He said that he finds large pale color liver, large kidneys, and a lot of fat in the abdomen, and thymus is atrophied. And I said, stop right there. You just said that there is a lot of fat in these chickens. He said, yes. Why is there a lot of fat in a bird that has died due to a viral infection? Doesn't make sense, because if at all one would expect that a chicken died due to viral infection should have no or little fat. So he said, you're right. So I thought, is it possible that a virus such as SMAM1 is making them fat? Duranda had to find out if his hunch was right. The only way was to infect healthy chickens with the virus and measure the results against an uninfected control group. The blood of the infected birds was tested for antibodies to the virus. If they were present, this would confirm the bird had the infection. And in three weeks, to our surprise and joy perhaps, we saw that the infected chickens really had significantly more body fat. So the virus SMAM1 was making the birds fatter. My immediate next thought was, does this happen in humans? Whether chickens become fat or not is of little relevance to me so far as my obesity practice goes. So I wanted to see, is it related to human obesity? And for that, I had patients coming to my clinic. I said, well, let me just see if uh, any of them carry antibodies to this virus. Duranda set about screening patients at his obesity clinic for this chicken virus. Amazingly, out of the 52 he examined, the 10 fattest tested positive. I was very excited and I was very convinced that this is a very important finding. That was the reason for, from there on, focusing on this 
as my life's mission, so to say. If Duranda's theory was correct, it would prove one of the most dramatic discoveries about obesity ever. But as with all radical ideas in science, there are plenty of skeptics. The idea that a virus might be causing obesity seems intrinsically unlikely. We know that obesity has been growing, if I can use that word, at a very constant rate for about 50 years. And the cause is pretty obvious. Uh, people are eating much more and they're taking less exercise. Why do we need to invent some strange theory about a virus? There are as many theories about obesity as there are calories in a Mars bar. Yet the idea that one day we may test for a fat virus is a radical departure. Meanwhile, for those who suffer the stigma of being obese, there is little understanding from a society who has come to see fat as plain ugly. Oh, it's very common to hear um, somebody say, well, why don't you just uh, have, you know, celery? Why don't you just eat, um, you know, ha have carrot sticks around? Or they'll start giving you hints on um, how to just cut back. Well, you know, if you just eat a little bit less. It would be like me telling a person who has diabetes to just get over it. Some people try to be really candid and like, oh, you've gained some weight, haven't you? And you've got some that's so blunt. Girl, how much weight are you going to gain? You're just getting so big. <laughs> it's just, you know, if I could get this weight off, I wouldn't be like this, you know. It's, just, it's not something that you can do overnight because the weight didn't come on overnight. We really don't know why people get fat or why people are skinny. There's so much, you know, that is unknown in this whole area. And that's why we need new theories and need people looking at the reasons why our bodies are the way we are. Back at the veterinary college of Bombay, Dr. Nicol Duranda was trying to develop his theory of how the SMAM1 virus might cause obesity in humans. The other thought that was at the back of my mind was that I'm treating people for obesity and if I pursue this new line of research and if it pans out, maybe I'll be able to touch many more lives. To tell the story of how a virus could make us fat might seem relatively straightforward. But even the plot in a Bombay blockbuster was never that simple. Duranda knew how it started, how you might catch the virus, but not much else. <laughs> what happened next, when the virus really got a grip, was a mystery. For a start, how did the virus make you fat? These were questions that needed answers. It's just a little sniffle. One little sneeze can do you no harm. Or can it? As it turned out, the true story of how the virus woos the body's fat cells was like a Bollywood epic. That you can eat between meals. To take the plot forward, Duranda had to look inside the body to see what the virus was getting up to. Oh, 
हाँ एक छींक के जरिए हम अंदर पहुंचे और खून की नसों में जा बैठे It soon became clear to Duranda that he did not have the facilities or the funds to continue his research in Bombay. If he was going to prove to the world that obesity was caused by a virus, he would have to take his chance in America. In 1992, Duranda, his wife and son with just six suitcases, moved to the United States. It was a big leap of faith to go to US because I had uh, three clinics and plenty of patients to take care of. And uh, to quit all that and to become a researcher again, and that too in an area that is not uh, really a conventional area, not a re readily acceptable area, I knew there would be struggle waiting for me. Duranda took up a research job in Fargo, North Dakota. He hoped he had an answer to an epidemic that causes around 280,000 deaths in the US each year. The job wasn't doing what he wanted, but he hoped and prayed that before long he would interest someone in his theory. I must have sent out about 200 letters, followed by phone calls. The response was not uh, good at all. I was desperate and worried, mainly because uh, I was not able to convince anybody uh, to get started with this work. After two cold, depressing winters in Fargo, and still no takers for his obesity virus, Duranda was ready to give up and return to Bombay. Then, a glimmer of hope. I got a letter from Nikhil uh, asking about a fellowship, but I couldn't uh, hire him at the time. So he asked if he could contact me again. So he called me and I said, no, 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 I don't have time now, I'm, I'm too busy. Called me back in a month, and one month later he called me, and I said, gosh, I'm still too busy. Give me another, give me a call in another month. One month later he called me, and finally, I said, this guy's pretty persistent. I better, better talk to him. I hired him two months before he was going to go back to India. This is uh, where it all happened. This was our laboratory. We had our tissue culture hood uh, over here, water bath, laboratory benches, freezer with a virus. I knew in my mind that I'll be of good help to him. I I didn't know how to tell him that, give me a chance. <laughs> you, won't, you won't regret. The Durandas moved to Wisconsin, home of the yard-long Bavarian sausage, and among the top 10 fattest states in the US. Nikhil is really a hero of science, in my opinion. This is a guy who was quite affluent in India. He was willing to take a 95% cut in pay to take his wife and child to a foreign country on the chance that he would be able to pursue his research. Yeah. Not very many people are willing to do something like that. Atkinson and Duranda set about developing the theory. They decided to repeat the chicken experiments with the SMAM1 bird virus from Bombay. So they applied to the authorities to import the pathogen. And very promptly, we got a refusal. They wouldn't let us import a virus that causes, possibly causes obesity. They didn't want that virus in this country. This was a major setback. 
Without SMAM-1, how could Aranda continue his life's mission? The only possibility lay in picking a virus from a catalogue that sold them to scientists for research work. Faced with this option, they decided to pick a human virus. The closest match were common or garden adenoviruses, the sort which give you colds and diarrhea. Could they also be causing obesity? But which one to pick? This was a problem. How can one pick which one to use out of 50 different adenoviruses? And that's where we were sort of stuck for a while. So I told uh, Nikhil, look at that book, go through there, you pick out a virus, I'll go through the book, I'll pick out a virus. So Nikhil chose his virus. And by fate, that particular virus, they were having trouble at the virus bank in Washington. So he ended up ordering the virus that I had chosen, and that one turned out to be AD36. AD36 was given to the chickens, but would it work? Would it make them fat like the ones in Bombay? Atkinson and Duranda waited three long weeks for the results. The high moments in the life of a scientist are when you've had an hypothesis, you've done an experiment, you look at the data and, wow, it worked. And certainly, Nikhil Durander sitting at the, uh, uh, sitting at the tissue culture hood could see the effects of uh, the virus on the cells in the chickens, and he knew that we had been able to infect the chickens. Oh, I was ecstatic to find that 8036 was the one out of those 50 human adenoviruses uh, that would do it. Unbelievable. I thought it was unbelievable luck. But chickens are not humans. The next step was to test AD36 on our closer cousins, the monkeys. Atkinson and Duranda chose marmosets. They may look small, but in genetic makeup, they are very similar to humans. We literally squirted a little bit right up their nose, uh, just a drop of the virus into three marmosets. We watched them over time, we weighed them, we collected blood several times to look for antibodies. We collected feces to look to see if they had the virus growing in their feces. And at the end of the experiment, the infected animals had gained four times as much weight and had just about doubled their body fat. Okay, what we'll wager up there? If this was translated to a human scale, it suggested the virus could transform a 10-stone weakling into a 40-stone hulk. But then again, marmosets are not humans, as Duranda's critics are quick to point out. The marmoset results, I think, are very good, very useful. But we must remember that there are many other animal modern systems which are useful, but are not directly applicable to human disease. There's a herpes virus which can infect marmosets and produce lymphomas. But that virus has no relationship to human lymphomas. So I think we must be aware eh, of making this direct jump from a model system to human disease. The quickest fix for Duranda's critics might seem to be to squirt the virus up the nostril of some willing human volunteer. We cannot infect humans for ethical reasons. We don't want to infect them with this virus and possibly make them obese. 
that would really not be ethical, especially when we don't have a cure for what we would be producing in these humans experimentally. But human data was essential to advance the cause. Duranda and Atkinson decided to screen groups of both obese and lean people for antibodies to AD 36. They examined the blood of 500 people from three cities in the US, and the results were remarkable. 30% of the obese people that we screened had antibodies to AD 36, whereas only 5 to 10% of the non-obese people had antibodies to AD 36. Without actually infecting humans himself, this was as close as Duranda could get to proving his case. The results suggested that as many as 12 million Americans had been infected with the virus. But the scientific community was still not impressed. I have talked to a number of uh, virologists about these results, and they are all deeply skeptical. And the reason is fundamentally that so far, there has been no disease attributed to an adenovirus infection, which is long lasting. And this would appear to be the situation if you attribute adeno 36 infection to obesity. However, uh, one should always have an open mind, but the evidence certainly at present is it's extremely difficult to accept his assertions. Professor Russell has been studying adenoviruses for 40 years. He's not the only one to doubt Duranda's theory. I was at a conference and I was standing in a line for registration. And these were all scientists standing in the line. And we were just chatting about what do you do and what do I do and what's my research interest. And uh, this uh, lady in front of me asked about my research and I told her about this virus and causing obesity in animals and so on. And she listened with interest for perhaps 10 minutes I talked. And then she says, a virus causing obesity? I don't think so. And my reaction was, I don't care. I don't care whether you think whether a virus causes obesity or not. I have data to show virus causes obesity. I'd like to see how this virus, which apparently by magic makes you obese, actually works. I'd like to see some concrete evidence, not just a, a, a vague hand-waving that after the virus they get fat. This is Duranda's next big challenge, to unravel the mechanism. How exactly does the virus make us fat? This is the plot so far. The virus travels through the blood. At first, Aranda wondered if it directly attacked the hypothalamus, the part of the brain controlling basic functions like appetite. But he found no evidence of this. So was the virus more interested in the cells in our body? Duranda made a startling discovery. He found the virus hunting down the pre-fat cells. These are immature cells waiting to become fat cells when the body needs to store more fat. The virus forces its DNA into the pre-fat cell, which is powerless to resist. Soon the viral DNA triggers changes in the cell's DNA, turning the little pre-fat cell into a plump 
fat cell. One thing we have been able to show in the lab, in a petri dish, in a, is we took cells that were pre-fat cells and infect them with a virus, and we see remarkable change of, from pre-fat cells to fat cells. Duranda believes that the virus turns millions of these pre-fat cells into fat cells, and so the body gets fatter and fatter. अब मेरी जा तू फंसी बचने की उम्मीद नहीं कुछ ही लम्हों में तुम मेरी बन जाओगी और हमेशा मोटी रहोगी अरे बाबा लेकिन मरते दम तक तो मैं डाइट करूंगी ना उसका क्या फायदा होगा मेरे होने वाली हो गोल मटोल प्यारी सी The damage is done. Fat forever. Unless Duranda finds a cure. The Durandas have now moved to a comfortable suburb outside Detroit. Enticed by a private donation of $2 million, Duranda is now researching his obesity virus at Wayne State University. I wake up at about 6, 6.30, work till 7.30, go home, spend some time with my wife and son, have dinner, and then my time starts by about 10, 10.30. I start working again till 2.30, 3 o'clock is when I go to bed. But I've been doing it for years now, so I'm used to it. Though Duranda tirelessly investigates his virus, nothing slows the rate at which the obesity epidemic is spreading across the United States. The question is, you know, why now? Why is the virus playing a role now? Viruses lay dormant for many years. HIV is the perfect example where we've seen uh, a crossover from animals to humans. We may be seeing somewhat similar now. We may be seeing exactly uh, a parallel with the HIV virus. We may be seeing this virus now finally taking over and playing its role now. It's not unusual. This is what viruses do. The virus was first isolated in 1978. Now, 1978 is right around the time that we had this big uh, increase in the prevalence of obesity. So I think it's quite possible that what happened is, let's construct a scenario. A person working on the chicken farms in India had an adenovirus, let's say, 8036. And he was working with the chickens who had SMAM1 and the two viruses got together, exchanged genetic material, and a new kind of AD36 came out that then got passed on. That's a scenario that's a possibility. So how far has AD36 traveled? And which countries are infected? Research is undergoing to determine prevalence in various other countries in the world, and uh, we don't know the answer yet. But it is possible that uh, there is similar prevalence in UK, perhaps. We decided to test for the virus in the UK to see if it has infected the obese over here. A group of volunteers traveled to a leading London clinic to give a blood sample. As with the field research done in the US, we screened both lean volunteers as well as obese to see that the virus was not present in both. Which one's that? Which diet? Natalie Spring? 
Don't move. The reason I've, I put on weight and put on so much weight is that I'm greedy. Um, it, it's not a joke when I say why I have one chocolate hobnob when you can have the packet, because that's what I'll have, the packet. I do feel jealous of very slim people, you know, they can do a lot of things where as if I wanted to get down on the floor, you know, with my children to play with them, I find it very difficult, you know, because I have to think about how am I going to get back up, but with slim people, they don't have a problem, so it's, it's a struggle, it really is. The last resort was... Um, getting stuck in the car and having to have my spouse get the toolkit out and unbolt the seat to let me out and by that time I felt as though I was in a circus because the humiliation of the crowd gathering was quite horrendous. He was angry with me and told me that you know I should get my life in order and lose weight. The blood samples were spun in a centrifuge and the extracted serum put in coded test tubes so that Duranda's lab could not know who was fat and who was thin. The test tubes were then placed in liquid nitrogen for shipping back to the US. How would our volunteers react if they found out they had been infected by the AD36 virus? If I found I had it and that it was a possible cause of, of my obesity, it would make me probably feel a, bit, a little bit better about myself. Um, because there is this thing that fat people are just slobs that sit in a chair. If it could offer some sort of magic bullet to make me sort of um, lose weight, I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be over the moon about it. Um, I'm quite interested to find out if there is a reason for it. I still suspect um, a lot of these genetics, but if there was an AD36 and I was suffering from it, or had suffered from it, or had some effects from it, and somebody could offer me a course of tablets that reduced me down to sort of 12 stone, you know, for, I'd, I'd be over the moon. I really would be, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be, I think it'd be fantastic. If a virus causes obesity, how is that going to affect people? I worry a little bit about the person looking at an obese person may become even more discriminatory because you've got a virus, I don't want to catch it, you stay away from me. So it's possible that there will be an even worse discrimination against obesity. And that's very foolish because the virus comes, does its work and goes away. So the person that you have to worry about is not the fat person, it's the skinny person with a cold. Twins set the toughest test for Dr. Duranda's theory that a virus might cause obesity in humans. Scientists have long been intrigued by how identical twins are nearly always exactly the same weight, often down to the last pound. Now, identical twins have the same genes. So this suggests that genetics must play a large part in controlling their identical body weight. But what about those exceptions where one twin weighs more than the other. What's going on in these rare cases? Um, my name is Beth and this is my identical twin sister Kristen and we're 20. To find out, we invited identical twins Kristen and Beth to take part in a small experiment. 110. 146. Kristen weighs two and a half stone more than Beth. Yet throughout their life, they had eaten similar foods and done equal amounts of exercise. So why do they think they are now different weights? I guess one of the reasons I always thought was um, 
we went away to college our, two years ago, and that's when we noticed a weight difference. So I always thought it might have had something to do with that, going to, going to college. So was it something at college or the virus that was responsible? If it was AD 36, this is strong evidence to answer the toughest critic. This is the closest we can come to showing the effect of AD 36 in humans and in human obesity. We took blood samples from both twins and had them screened for the virus. We've got the results. Beth, you're negative. But Kristen, it seems you do have the virus. At this point, I don't know whether she will continue to gain or she will stop where she is now. It is possible that she will continue to increase her weight, but we just don't have enough data, enough information at the moment. We need more research to find out what is the long-term effect of viral infection on body weight. Meanwhile, our blood serum samples taken from volunteers in the UK were being unpacked in Duranda's lab in Detroit. Over a set of stages, the blood serum is mixed with small amounts of AD 36. If it contains antibodies developed from a past infection, these will now destroy the virus, giving a positive result. The tests reveal that none in our lean group has ever had AD 36. But one in six of our obese volunteers tested positive. This raises the possibility that across the UK, as many as two million may be infected. A significant number of samples from UK have AD36 antibodies, which means that perhaps this virus is prevalent in UK as well. We visited our volunteers to get their reactions to the results, both negative and positive. In your case, Dr. Duranda found that you were antibody positive to AD 36. This means that you probably have had the virus for some time in your life. Actually, that quite surprised me because I really did think uh, that I would uh, be negative because my parents, are, my, my, my family tends to be rather large and I just assumed that I was genetically predispositioned. But I must admit, my weight did come on very, very quickly. Um, so perhaps that was it. I don't know, perhaps my father had it as well. I don't know. Dear Heather, in your case, Dr. Duranda found that you were antibody negative to AD 36. This means that you have not had the virus. <sighs> I'm not too sure um, what my thoughts are about this letter because I thought I had the virus. And if I had the virus, then I could say yes, you know, this is why I'm obese, because I've got this virus. Dear Sandra, we've now the results of your recent screening of the AD36 virus. In your case, found the antibody was positive to AD36. Wow, I've always known there was more to me being obese rather than overeating. Um, from early childhood, adolescence, teenage years, early adult life. I've always known there's been more and it's been very, very difficult to try and get people to understand it wasn't just about overeating. At some point in the future, I'd like to think that there will be a cure for this virus. I've got some ray of light at the end of a tunnel or whatever the expression might be, but um... If, if it doesn't affect me, if they can't do anything for me, in my particular case, 
Like, I'm no worse off. I'm no worse off. But it does give me some sort of hope that there may be something that can, that can be done in my case. I am afraid that if you've gotten the virus, you're stuck. Uh, the virus probably comes, does its work, does its work, and then goes away. The body fights off the virus. The virus is gone, but the consequences are still there. There may be no cure at this stage, but it is still early days in Duranda's research. With publications in major scientific journals and funding from the prestigious National Institute of Health, there is no dampening his enthusiasm for his lifelong affair with a virus. It would be absolutely fascinating to have a vaccine to prevent at least some type of obesity. That's my dream. But as in all good science, he will have to convince the skeptics before his theories will be universally accepted. As a physician, I know obesity kills. So yes, it's absolutely urgent and imperative we do something about the current epidemic of obesity. But what we do has got to be effective. It's got to be the right thing. Going down a wild goose trail doesn't really help us. Why don't people believe this? Uh, I think to some extent, it's because there's such a discrimination against obesity. The, the feeling that obese people are fat simply because they eat too much, they just don't have any willpower, is very pervasive. And if this virus theory proves to be true, and anyone could catch obesity, that's very, very scary. So the final scene that proves a virus can cause obesity is yet to be written. And then Duranda will have to wait for the reviews from the critics. अब मैं चला किसी और को परेशान करने के लिए जाने मन जाने जा थोड़ी सी मोटी हो जाओ जाने मन जाने जा थोड़ी सी मोटी हो जाओ जाने मन जाने जा